Look at these two pictures. At first glance, one might think, well, aren't they showing the exact same thing? Truth is, they don't. But both these subjects are some of the most complex structures humans have ever had the chance to study. The first image shows a cluster of galaxies from our universe. The second is just a small neuron in the human brain. After seeing these images, some were quick to compare them. Is the universe nothing more than a huge brain? Now let's not get too excited. Before we go into describing all the similarities between the universe and the human brain, there is something we need to be aware of. It's a little thing called apophonia. And it's when our brains make up similarities between two objects that are seriously unrelated. The best example is when we look at clouds and start to see all sorts of cute animals and weirdly shaped objects. We might be doing the same thing when looking at those two initial pictures. Maybe it's just our brain making up similarities where there aren't any. Some scientists became fascinated with this huge brain universe idea. They wanted to make sure it was not just a weird coincidence. There had to be a way they could measure how the universe compares to the mushy organ inside our heads. So they started with the brain. It's probably one of the most complicated things we know in the whole universe. That's because it's packed with more than 80 billion neurons. These cells are responsible for taking information from our senses and sending out messages all over our body. Try to think of neurons as workers in a factory. They don't just do their work, they actually communicate with each other, thanks to these elements called axons and dendrites. The axons are responsible for carrying electrical signals away from the neuron's body to other neurons or muscles. Dendrites, on the other hand, have the task of receiving that information. All of them together make this mega network of about 100 trillion connections. The universe is one big social network itself too, but this time it's made up of galaxies. You might picture the universe as stars and planets with a ton of empty space between them. It's not quite right. What we can see and measure is known as the observable universe, and it's really vast. Think about 90 billion light years across containing hundreds of billions to maybe a few trillion of galaxies. These galaxies, like the one we're standing in at this very moment, are bundled together in groups. Our Milky Way is friends, in a way, with galaxies like Andromeda and Triangulum. And altogether, they're a family called the Local Group. This family of galaxies is part of an even bigger bunch called the Virgo Supercluster. From what we can tell, the space between them might not be empty. It's filled with these threads made up of regular matter, but there might also be this mysterious dark matter doing its thing. Scientists didn't stop there. They decided to take it a bit further. They started by examining thin slices of the human cortex, the part responsible for our thoughts, memories, and even our consciousness. The next step was to compare them with equally thin slices of the universe from a computer simulation. Now it's obvious there's this enormous size difference between the brain and the universe. But the way they looked at it kind of made them somewhat comparable. As they zoomed in, think 40 times magnification, these scientists began noticing that the structures were very much alike. At this zoom, the brain's neural network looked like the universe's galaxy clusters. To make sure they weren't just imagining things, they used two clever methods. The first one looked at how these networks connected and how densely packed they were. They noticed that the middle part of a neuron, or its nucleus, is way tinier compared to its connecting fragments. Likewise, galaxy clusters are tiny when you look at the super long connecting threads between them. The second method was about checking how organized these networks were versus just being random. They looked at how everything was structured around each connection point, whether it was a neuron in the brain or a galaxy cluster in the universe. The resemblance doesn't stop there. We know that our brain is mostly water, about 70% to be precise. Now the cosmic web in space, it too has about 70% of something, only this time it's dark energy. Water and dark energy may not be the most important elements in each of their structures, but they might still play a part in how everything sets up. The analogy continues. 
You see, the space we'd need on a computer to map out the universe is almost the same as our brain's memory storage. Somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 petabytes. So, theoretically, a chunk of the universe could fit in our brains. Or flip that, and our entire life's memories could get stored in the universe's network. There are differences too, and we have to be aware of them to make sure we're assessing things properly. For starters, the universe is pretty much the same all over. It doesn't change its composition that much, regardless of where you travel in the observable area. But our brain, not so much. Different parts have different jobs. Also, our brain connections send information depending on things like what you're seeing or touching. On the flip side, the universe's links are just energy. There's also a difference between how these two structures came to be. It turns out that the patterns we see when we're gazing up at the stars are all shaped by gravity and some weird unseen force called dark matter. Massive fireworks in space called supernovae can also affect this cosmic wallpaper. On the opposite side of the spectrum, our brains got their shape from evolution. That long process where animals, including us, get to pass on the best features and data they've learned to their offspring. So, if a trait like a certain shape of the brain helped our ancestors dodge a hungry tiger, that trait got passed down. Our brains are also built the way they are because they're supposed to act like a superhighway for our thoughts. Quick thinking was crucial for people back in the day when they needed shelter from wild animals or the elements. Now, especially if you're a fan of sci-fi literature, you might be wondering, if the universe is like this immense brain, what might its body look like? We might as well be living in someone else's head. We like to think of humans as evolved, intelligent, and at times, hard to understand creatures. But what if we're just tiny neurons in a larger, more complex structure? Well, for the time being, we can only let our imaginations run wild. There's no way we can test at this point what's outside our universe. By all means, we don't even know how large it is. By looking at the parts we can see, the estimations are that the universe is about 95 billion light years in diameter. Even if we'd somehow manage to travel at the speed of light, though that seems a bit impossible at the moment too, it would take an enormous amount of time to reach those supposed edges of the universe. There's also the theory of the multiverse. We don't have much tangible proof of this idea either, but it does claim we live in a universe out of many. Ours has time and space. Other worlds may have different rules and components. Life may look differently out there in ways we can't even understand. Having a better understanding of the universe is just as important as figuring out our brains. You see, we still have many unsolved mysteries right here under our noses or behind our noses to be more precise. There are a lot of things we've yet to figure out about the human brain, like how we store and retrieve memories. We know that each time we learn some new piece of information, our brain changes. But we don't have the entire process mapped out, and it looks like it might take a while before we fully understand it. A recent study suggests the universe is similar to your brain only at a much, much larger scale. The brain's neural network contains about 86 billion neurons. The observable universe has at least 100 billion galaxies. Both galaxies and neurons have a similar structure. It's a complex web of nodes linking up long thread-like fibers. But in each of these systems, the fibers make up a mere 30% of the total mass, and the remaining 70% are either water in the brain or dark energy in the universe. The ways that galaxies and webs of neurons connect with one another are surprisingly similar. In both cases, the process follows the same physical principles. At the same time, some researchers claim the resemblance between the brain and the universe is only superficial. Your mind perceives tiny details and joins them. And then it comes up with a conclusion that has nothing in common with reality, like the brain is a mini-universe. In billions of years, the universe is likely to expand so much that we won't be able to see any stars in the sky. To turn Earth into a black hole, 
you'd have to squeeze it until it was the size of a marble. And if you wanted the sun to become a black hole, you'd have to compress it until it's no more than four miles across. A starburst galaxy is a galaxy that's forming tons of new stars at breakneck speed. It usually happens after two galaxies merge into one. While Earth has only one natural satellite, Jupiter is surrounded by at least 79 moons. In the universe, there are not only dwarf planets, but also dwarf galaxies. They have from 1,000 to a few billion stars. For comparison, the Milky Way galaxy is made up of 250 to 400 billion stars. A supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from Earth hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's one quadrillion, which is one with 15 zeros, times deeper than what the human ear can hear. Planet Kelt 9b is 670 light years away from Earth. It's an ultra hot Jupiter. Those are giant, scorching hot planets with a mass similar to that of Jupiter. On Kelt 9b, the heat is so great on the day side of the planet, it tears molecules apart. Any liquid floating in outer space forms itself into a sphere. It also happens in low Earth orbit. Our home Milky Way galaxy is more than 105,000 light years across. All the planets of the solar system would fit between Earth and the Moon with some space to spare. Black holes spaghettify things. It happens when something gets past the point of no return. Then the black hole's gravitational pull starts to stretch this object in one direction and squeeze in another. The first celestial body that astronomers identified as a spiral was the Whirlpool Galaxy. Its long arms are made of gas and stars, and everything is sprinkled with fine space dust. When you're on Earth, you can only see 5% of the universe. A star coming too close to a black hole can be torn apart by its gravitational force. WASP-12b is a giant planet 1,400 light years away from Earth. It's made up mostly of gas. Unfortunately, the planet is doomed. It orbits too close to its parent star. In about 10 million years, WASP-12b will be swallowed by its greedy sun. Our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, its closest neighbor, are going to meet in a bit less than 4 billion years. When they collide, they'll form one huge elliptical galaxy. One of Saturn's smaller moons, Enceladus, reflects almost 90% of the sun's light. It makes the moon one of the brightest objects in the solar system. But since it reflects sunlight instead of absorbing it, the temperatures on Enceladus's icy surface drop to negative 330 degrees Fahrenheit. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. In our solar system, Mercury and Venus are the only two planets without moons. Scientists who are planning to send droids to Mars want to load the machines with lots of heavy equipment. The droids will also be built from stronger materials, all because of the relatively low gravity on the red planet. Everything on Mars is almost three times lighter than on Earth. Pluto's largest moon is half the size of the dwarf planet itself. This makes Charon, that's the moon's name, the largest known satellite relative to its parent size. There are three golf balls on the moon. They were launched during the Apollo 14 mission. Mathematicians claim white holes might exist, even though scientists haven't found one yet. If you came across a white hole, you wouldn't be able to enter it from the outside. But you'd see light and matter escaping from within. On our planet, one full rotation takes one day. But the sun is so enormous that it needs 25 to 35 Earth days to make one rotation. 
The moon is not a perfect sphere. It's shaped more like an egg because of the Earth's gravity. Spacesuits protect astronauts from huge temperature differences during spacewalks, from negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit to positive 250 degrees Fahrenheit. A neutron star gets born after a supernova collapses. After birth, it rotates extremely fast, about 60 times per second. But this rate can sometimes grow up to 600 times per second. In 2007, astronomers started to receive ultra-bright and ultra-strong radio signals. Named fast radio bursts, they were coming from somewhere billions of light years away. When astronauts are in space, they often see random flashes of light. They occur when cosmic rays hit the optic nerve in the eye. If you traveled around Pluto's equator, it would be the same distance as walking from Rome to New York City. If you visited GJ504b, a planet located a mere 57 light years away from Earth, you'd see that the planet is glowing. It's because of the heat left after its formation. The planet's color is a dull magenta, like a dark cherry blossom. Jupiter has the shortest day of all the planets in the solar system. It lasts just 9 hours and 55 minutes. Because of its fast rotation, Jupiter isn't a perfect sphere. It's a bit flattened. Venus has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. There are at least 1,600 of them on the planet's surface, but most of them are extinct. Mercury has wrinkles. When its iron core was cooling, the planet's crust contracted. It made the surface of the planet uneven. Nuclear pasta found inside neutron stars is believed to be the strongest substance in the universe. These noodles of neutrons can be 10 billion times stronger than steel. Some astronomers believe black holes might have no event horizon, aka the point of no return. Instead, there might be the apparent horizon. It can only trap stuff for some time. Later, matter or energy escapes, but in a different form. Each Apollo mission needed 15 spacesuits. Each member of the three-person main crew needed three suits. One was for training, the second for flight. And there was also a backup suit, in case something went wrong with the flight suit. And each of the three members of the backup crew had two spacesuits, one for training and one for flight. Scientists believe Mercury might still have a partially molten core. It could explain why the planet has a magnetic field, even if it's just 1% as strong as Earth's. Dust storms on Mars are the most severe in the whole solar system. They can be raging for months on end. On planet Kepler-16b, which is 245 light years away from Earth, not one, but two suns set over the horizon. The planet is as massive as our Saturn, but has a higher density. It takes 45 minutes to put on a spacesuit. After it's done, an astronaut needs another hour to adapt to new conditions. Earth grazing fireballs are bright meteors that enter the Earth's atmosphere, but then leave it again. Triton, one of Neptune's moons, orbits the planet backward. It's the only big moon of any known planet to do so. Triton is also gradually getting closer to Neptune. Experts think that, eventually, the moon will be pulled apart by Neptune's gravity, and then it'll form a ring around the gas giant. Dwarf planet Haumea, which is further from Earth than Neptune, is truly bizarre. It's orbiting in the Kuiper Belt, a donut-shaped ring of ice objects circling the sun. Haumea has two moons, a weirdly elongated shape, and a day that lasts four Earth hours. But the coolest thing, the dwarf planet is surrounded by incredibly thin rings. They're likely the result of an ancient collision. It takes Neptune almost 165 Earth years to make one full orbit around the Sun. In other words, since the gas giant was discovered in 1846, it's only circled the Sun once. 
Yep, your brain will grow by roughly 2% if you venture into space. Under normal gravity, it is thought that fluid in the brain naturally moves downwards when we stand upright. But there is evidence that lack of gravity prevents this, which is why fluid accumulates in the brain and skull. While a bunch of flowers may be fragrant for you, there are people with cacosmia who would beg to differ. They perceive all the smells out there as something odorous. Well, that stinks. Speaking of which, out of all the senses we have, smell is the most acute one. We remember 65% of smells after a year, but only 50% of what we've seen over the last three weeks. We also get a new nose every 28 days, because the nose cells are renewed every four weeks. We don't smell when we sleep. Well, of course, unless you haven't bathed in a while. Your sense of smell goes to sleep when you do, which is why it's almost impossible to notice a gas leak at night. While sleeping, we rely only on sound because the sleep can be disrupted by noise. Almost half of your taste buds will have gone away by the time you turn 60. So maybe you will finally start eating those broccoli. Your sense of smell gets less acute as you get older as well. As for taste again, we mostly rely on our smell since it helps us perceive up to 95% of the flavor. Without the sense of smell, it'd be hard to tell an apple from a turnip. Now, when you cough, you release the air at about 60 miles per hour, so mind the speed limit. Hiccups is a two-step process. First, you draw in a lot of air because of a muscle spasm, and then bang, the airways are closed, the air is blocked, and the famous sound goes outside. We need ears, not only for hearing, but for balance, too. Our vestibular system occupies the inner ear. Canals in your inner ear contain fluid and tiny sensors helping you keep the balance. By the way, ears have bones. These are also the only bones that never grow. We can hear thanks to these little guys since they transmit sound vibrations. Doctors call them oscular chain, and it's made up of malleus, incus, and stapes, nicknamed hammer, anvil, and stirrup, which are integral parts of the middle ear. Our ears keep growing throughout our lives. They sweat too, and earwax is actually a kind of sweat they produce. Oh, by the way, the nose never stops growing either. Perhaps from all the lies. <laughs> Your heart is the only muscle that never gets tired. The aorta is massive. Its diameter is almost as large as a hose in your garden. All the bones in our body are connected to each other except for the hyoid, which doesn't articulate with the other bones. This bone serves as support to your tongue, and it's one of the rarest bones to break. If you have red eyes in a photo, blame it on bouncing light. The flash jumps off the capillaries in your retina, creating that effect. As for eyes, the coolest camera so far has 200 megapixels. The human eye has 576. That's why sunsets are so much better in real life than in photos. A roller coaster actually tosses your organs around. When you feel like your stomach's falling down, it's really flipping inside your body. Lips are much more sensitive than fingers, having around a million nerve endings. They are 100 times as sensitive as the tips of the fingers. Grooves and furrows make our lip print unique, just like fingerprints are. They also remain unchanged throughout our life. Oh, the tongue print is unique too, by the way. Even though all the people on Earth have an absolutely unique smell, identical twins smell exactly the same. It must be because they have identical genes. Usually, we shed about 50 to 150 hairs a day. An average lifespan for hair is 5 years, and as soon as an old hair says goodbye to your scalp, a new one starts growing immediately. In your body, you carry enough bacteria to fill a can. Bacteria makes about 3 to 5 pounds of your weight, representing 2% of your total weight. Still, most of them are the waste that our body has. A human being has about 20,000 to 25,000 genes. Seems impressive, right? Well, cornflakes have more genes than we do. Luckily, it's about sophistication, not the quantity. Anyway, cornflakes one, humans zero. We consist of many chemical elements, including iron. The iron in our bodies is enough to produce three nails, each one inch long. 
The carbon that we have can be used for 900 pencils. Our feathers can be used to make quill pens. Wait, that's birds. Never mind. Our liver has a superpower of regenerating if part of it was removed. It can grow back to the size that your body needs. Fat helps our bodies consume vitamins. Such vitamins as A, D, K, and E can be properly absorbed only when fat dissolves. Our bodies have enough fat to produce 7 bars of soap. Uh, don't try this at home. When we're awake, our brain may produce enough energy to turn an electric bulb on. It has 10 watts of power. What's that about? Our belly buttons have an entire animal encyclopedia in them, with a range of about 70 different bacteria. Some of them can be also found in the soil of Japan and even in polar ice caps. Our bodies actually glow. Anyway, we can't see that with an unaided eye because the light we emit is 1,000 times less intense than the minimum level we can perceive. Speaking of which, carmine used blushes and lipsticks is red dye made up of ground-up beetles. Oh. Saliva helps to taste food. Our taste buds are ready to perceive it only when it's dissolved by saliva. An eyelash is here to stay for 150 days only. The world eyelash record was about 3 inches long. They're also home for tiny mites. We blink about 4,200,000 times a year, at least once every 8 seconds. Could be cool if we were given a cent every time we blink. We could make more than $100 daily. It may sound crazy, but our bones are stronger than lots of building materials. A cubic inch of human bone can bear about 19,000 pounds, making it four times stronger than concrete. The only thing that makes our blood type different is sugar. A, B, and AB types have sugars, while O has none, which makes it perfect for donors. No sugar doesn't make O type less sweet. In fact, it attracts mosquitoes even more than the other blood types. People have only 8 blood types, while cows have 800 and possibly more. Like what? Moo positive and moo negative? Our fingernails grow way faster than toenails. They grow almost 4 times slower because they have less damage than fingernails. Even though we stumble on them often, sudden circulation bursts usually don't last long. Nails don't only help us catch random tiny objects and peel the stickers off. If you didn't have a rigid structure against which to press, you wouldn't be able to judge how firmly to hold anything. Very few people can actually digest milk. The thing is, there's some special enzyme, let's call it a little helper, that breaks down the sugars any milk has. When people grow up, they run out of this enzyme. This sugar's called lactose, so adults that can't digest it are lactose intolerant. 68% of the world's population can actually digest milk. If you're sleeping, it doesn't mean your whole body rests. In fact, sometimes your brain has to work even harder when you're asleep. It needs to process tons of information, and reports usually take a lot of time. Humans can't multitask. Really? We need time to switch from one task to another. But if we try to tackle several things at the same time, it's not going to be very productive. Try this one. Lift your right foot and start rotating it in a clockwise direction. Try to write the number 6 with your big toe in the air. Now, check the direction your foot's moving. It's moving in the opposite direction, because to write the number 6, you need to make a counterclockwise movement. It actually takes a bit longer to start a new habit. It's not 100% true that 18 or 21 days are enough, as many people think. The process of getting a new habit can take up to 254 days, but on average, it takes around 66 days for a new habit to become automatic. When you want to say something, your brain sends a signal to your lungs, mouth, tongue. In a moment, you pronounce the word. Light reflects off objects. Your eyes translate it into electrical impulses, and your brain understands what you're looking at. Talking, moving, seeing, breathing, it's all a split-second transfer of signals going on in your body. Now, imagine you have not two, but 16 billion eyes, hands, and feet. No, 
Your own physical body hasn't changed at all. But your brain is taking in information from 8 billion other people on the planet as well. Because it's not your brain and mind. All these bodies are controlled by one common brain. It's not as sci-fi as it sounds. Collective intelligence already exists in nature. Beehives and ant colonies have a unique ability to work as one single organism. A colony of insects resembles a working brain, where each individual inside is like a neuron. So, what if evolution created humans, not as independent beings with our own personal thoughts, known only to us except when we decide to share them? Let's say we're all one big colony with a single shared brain. But for fun, we'll say you're not part of this unified brain. You're a space traveler, and you've just arrived on Earth. The dominant life form is the human being. The first thing that strikes you is communication. You're talking to a young guy on the street. We live here, he says, and abruptly walks away. In peace and calm, a woman riding a bike zooms past you. All the people here, a construction worker shouts from the roof of a nearby building. Work for the common good, an elderly lady says, sitting on a bench. You communicate simultaneously with all people, as if with one person. If someone starts a conversation with you here in the city, then any person on the other side of the planet can continue the dialogue. Eight billion people on Earth know what you're talking about right now and know what you look like. As a single organism, the entire world population is aware of everything happening at any moment in time. There's no need for phones or texting. You don't need to call and check up on your friend or relative. You know how they're doing, and they know how you're doing. One person can't do something in secret from others. It's as if your pinky toe decided to live an independent life. You'd immediately know about it. You can't plan to take something without asking or do someone wrong. That person shares your thoughts. You can also forget about surprising someone with a gift. They already know. They were in your head when you bought it. In ordinary life, every person has their own inner world, secrets, mysteries. Not anymore. Here, everyone knows everything about each other because we are each other. People see the same dreams. No one's hiding anything. Lies no longer exist. For such a huge organism in the form of billions of people, there's only one goal, prosperity for the unit. People here don't build monuments to themselves. They don't create and compete for hundreds of different brands of cars, phones, accessories, or clothes. Everyone lives like bees in a honeycomb. Many of the houses and buildings are completely identical for the sake of efficiency. But some are real works of art. Beautiful architecture and highly developed cities are decorations for the global mind. Every resident knows exactly what their duties are. That person uses a car to deliver cargo. Another is walking to an office every day. Others use planes and ships to get their job done. There are millions of different tasks, and none of them is pointless. If the brain wants a castle, the individuals build it. If the brain needs a spaceship, they create it. Many inhabitants work in a power plant or food factory, so everyone gets all the necessities for a normal, comfortable life. There's no need for newspapers or official announcements. If scientists make a discovery, each person on the planet will know about it instantly. A lot of jobs involve keeping an eye on the planet and atmosphere so it doesn't get too dirty. It's all for the good of the common being. If even just one of the individuals isn't okay, anyone nearby will do everything possible to help them. Think of it like one of your fingers being weak or hurt. 
the whole hand can't grasp as strongly. Again, the unit needs strong, healthy individuals. But it's not all work and business. Any brain likes to relax, so people here organize parties on a planetary scale. There's also entertainment, just not the kind you're used to. No one makes movies or TV shows. There are no actors or glamorous stars. And what's the point of script writers or a film crew if the rest of the planet knows what it'll be about and how it'll end before the movie even comes out? No, the main entertainment here is science. So many resources are thrown into exploring the planet and space. The entire world holds its breath as a submarine descends into some unexplored part of the ocean. What's that? A new species never seen before in the Mariana Trench. As soon as the scientist sees the underwater cam footage, the whole planet rejoices at the discovery. Still, there are countless jobs connected to space exploration. The brain strives to find someone similar, another thinking being, an unknown one. Improvement and preservation of cities and nature, it's all top priority, so people can work and study comfortably. If you're working on a book or scientific article, it's much easier to do it in a clean place with access to food and water. When you, the visitor, arrived on this earth, you were given the most generous welcome. You're the second mind in this world, and you're very interesting to billions of people. But our collective mind comes with familiar baggage. The brain of an ordinary person isn't perfect. You know that feeling when you doubt yourself or you can't make the right decision. Part of you wants to quit a job you don't like and the other part persuades you not to. You constantly go back and forth with your mind, lost in your own thoughts. It can distract you from work, keep you up at night. Here, these doubts are projected onto billions of people and conflicts arise among them. Maybe the rooftop worker would rather be controlling that sub, exploring the ocean depths. Yes, everyone is needed. What they do is just as important, but we all have preferences, right? The collective mind can get upset, feel exhausted, or be desperate. We're still human after all. When this happens, the population slows down. The brain is sluggish, production lags. It's as if the whole world is in a fog. But sooner or later, this feeling passes, and the collective brain is in a good mood again. The busy bees return to their usual routine. Progress continues. Every year, the organism expands. More and more people are born. In the future, space and resources may no longer be enough. That's why setting up camp on a different planet is a growing priority. The first ships have already been built. They'll send hundreds of thousands of people to the Red Planet. As soon as this happens, the brain's horizons will expand. People still on Earth will know everything happening on Mars. You've been living on this Earth for many years, documenting what you see, this strange but highly efficient human being. But you've also noticed mysterious creatures living here. They only appear at night, live deep underground, and look just like the rest of the humans. But the oddest thing is that the 8 billion people and their collective intelligence don't notice these inhabitants. Soon you realize that these creatures are the subconscious. They hide somewhere deep, but at the same time, they control all those who live on the surface. As in the ordinary human brain, the subconscious mind is a mystery here. It affects the emotions and psyche of every person. It may even be the source of the collective dreams everyone has. The deepest fears of this species, their unified worries, the being, might not be able to explain why it feels so foggy and anxious sometimes. The subconscious below 
is pulling the strings. Or even behavior. Every memory the brain makes, all the information it takes in, it goes to those below. They use this information to protect the species. Ever had a gut feeling that you're making the wrong decision? Probably because you've met a similar situation and didn't learn from it. You don't remember, but your subconscious does, and it's trying to steer you in the right direction. All of it, above and below, preserves the species. Looks like the human being will be just fine. What makes space so terrifying is its unpredictability. Even though 99.99% .99 of the cosmos is a vacuum, if you encounter something of substance, the chances are high that it might easily end your life. And still, some things are scarier than others. For example, gamma ray bursts. When a galaxy explodes, it releases a powerful burst of gamma rays. And those can completely annihilate any asteroid or planet in their path. A gamma ray burst occurs in our home Milky Way galaxy once every five million years or so. Then there are vampire stars. Scientifically, they're known as O-type stars. Those are enormous blue giants attached to way smaller stars, which gradually get consumed by the gravitational pull of their huge neighbors. But vampire stars don't live long, happy lives. Once a space vampire has consumed a smaller star, it explodes into a supernova torn by its own gravity. Black holes are both endlessly intriguing and terrifying. They consume everything that comes too close and bend space-time around them. Can they get any scarier? Definitely, once we look at rogue black holes. One of them was discovered in 2016. This rogue black hole is heavier than the sun and is moving at a speed of more than 1,240 miles per second. This black hole could have broken away after the collisions of its home galaxy with another one. At the moment, it's around 2 billion light years away from us. Now, how about a mysterious space anomaly called the Great Attractor? This area lies around 150 to 250 million light years away from our galaxy. The Great Attractor's gravitational pull is so powerful that it can move entire galaxies toward itself making them collapse with one another. But the scariest thing? We still don't know what it is and whether our galaxy will end up in its clutches one day. Meteors might not sound particularly exciting or scary, but they are some of the most realistic threats to our planet. Thousands of meteorites hit Earth every year. Luckily, most of them are too small to cause any serious harm. They either burn in the planet's atmosphere or crash into the ocean. Our own sun can be pretty scary too, especially when it produces powerful bursts of energy. Solar flares, they often go hand in hand with coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with the temperatures reaching several million degrees F astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. A powerful solar storm can potentially cause a devastating global blackout on Earth. The next scary space phenomenon is the dark flow. All galaxies are supposed to be moving uniformly away from one another. But there's one large group of clusters that seems to be moving at a speed of 600 miles per second toward a small region of space between the constellations Centaurus and Vela. There seems to be no apparent cause for this, which is why this inexplicable phenomenon got its name. The cosmos also presents many dangers for astronauts. For example, extended space travel can apparently change human DNA. According to scientists, the stress from staying in space for too long might cause astronauts' cells to rewrite their genetic code. The worst thing 
is that such DNA changes are permanent. Despite all our differences, we share one thing in common. That's right, we all feel alive and actively perceive the present in this very moment. But here's the catch, my friends. This feeling of right now is in fact a little delayed. It takes about half a second for our brains to translate information into our consciences. If you think about it, technically, the future is already done for, but we're just not realizing this in due course. And that's not all. Our different senses pick up information each at their own pace, which means our brains have to drag some of them to give us a seamless sense of the present. It's like our brains are trying to stitch together a Frankenstein monster of sensory information in real time and make it look pretty. But here's where things get really wild. Researchers have found that they can mess with this perception. When that standard delay is removed, our brains get confused and it gives us the impression that the effect happened before the action that triggered it. It's like you'd perceive the doorbell sound but before you'd actually push the button. Weird, right? Why are our brains so easily fooled? Well, it's because our conscious minds have a lot of work to do. We have to translate the world around us, think about what might happen in the near future, and figure out what to do next. All of that takes time, which is not great when you're facing fast-moving danger. Imagine a dangerous wild animal jumps out at you. If you have to consciously think about how to react, you're done for. Luckily, our brains have emergency response kits that kick in when we need them most. The startle reflex is the fastest response triggered by a noise or sudden movement. Within 5 milliseconds, a lot of muscles are triggered into reacting, and you're already on the move before you know it. If we have a few more milliseconds, our brains can act in a more interesting way. The amygdala, our brain's first stop shop for processing emotions, takes about 12 milliseconds to process a threat. It's not super sophisticated, but it can easily detect danger. In fact, some of our best actions are done without conscious decision making. Anything we do in less than half a second, like hitting a ball or catching someone's glance, is done automatically. So, while our conscious minds are great for long-term strategy, some of our best actions are accomplished without it. But let's get down to the real question. Thoughts can vary, sure. We all know that because we've lived it. <laughs> Making a difficult career or parenting choice takes a lot more thinking than choosing what to top your ice cream with. But did you ever wonder what the speed of thought is? I mean, do we need a Ferrari to keep up with our brains or can we simply stick to a bicycle? Well, some scientists have tackled this tricky question by measuring how quickly we become aware of the information we gather through our senses. Apparently, we can detect stimuli that lasts as little as 50 milliseconds. That's about 1 20th of a second in case you're counting. Now, if we're talking about sensing and responding, let's use the sprinter reacting to the starting noise as a benchmark. That's lightning fast taking only about 150 milliseconds. However, the speed of our nerve pathways can put a damper on our speedy thoughts. Back in the day, scientists estimated that it took 115 feet per second for information to travel down our nerves. But thanks to modern research, we now know that some well-insulated nerves can move at up to a whopping 394 feet per second. That's comparable to a bunch of the world's fastest cars in the world, like an Aston Martin or a McLaren. When you put it that way, the speed of thought is pretty quick. But don't worry, you don't have to train like an Olympian to keep up with your own brain. You might have even stopped to think about how many thoughts you have in a day. That question counts as a thought too, you know. Spoiler alert, it's more than you think. From the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, and maybe even after that, your brain is constantly churning out thoughts. Some of these thoughts might be simple, like, I need to do laundry, or I should call my mom. Others might be more complex, like, what's the meaning of life, or how do we love? Believe it or not, a study conducted in 2020 found out that an average person has over 6,000 thoughts per day. That's a lot of thinking. 
The study used brain scans to track when new thoughts began while participants were either resting or watching a movie. But not all thoughts are created equal. Some thoughts can make us feel happy and excited, while others can bring us down and cause us to worry. For most people, those negative thoughts can be hard to shake. Also, did you know that your personality can affect how many thoughts you have? People who are a bit more on the jittery side tend to have more thoughts than those who are calmer. But don't worry, having a noisy brain doesn't automatically mean there's something wrong with you. Sometimes our brains can even produce intrusive thoughts that are disturbing or upsetting. While it's natural to have these kinds of thoughts occasionally, if they're happening frequently and disrupting your daily routine, it might be worth talking to a professional. So, where do all these thoughts come from? Your brain's nerve cells or neurons are responsible for communicating with other cells by generating neurotransmitters. This sets off a chain reaction of firing neurons, which then creates thoughts. But what if you want to change your thoughts? It's possible! Techniques like mindfulness and working with a trained specialist can help you address unwanted thoughts and give you a more relaxed state of mind. Our brains are somewhat similar to the muscles that help us move around. We can train it to make our lives better, to an extent that is. At the end of the day, it's not the number of thoughts that matters, but how they affect you and what comes out of them. Speaking of weird stuff brains can do, some mind-blowing news just hit the scientific community. Researchers have discovered some weird brain waves in octopuses. Yes, you heard that right. These eight-armed wonders feature a type of brain wave we've never stumbled upon in the animal kingdom. Now, before you go imagining little octopuses wearing tiny shower caps with electrodes sticking out, let me tell you how this discovery was made. Scientists surgically attached electrodes to octopuses' brains and were able to get a glimpse into their thought processes. The amazing project captured the first ever brain recordings of octopuses that can move around as they please, and the results are mind-bending. The researchers discovered that some of the brainwave patterns are much like some found in the human memory center. This suggests that convergent evolution may be at play here. What does convergent evolution mean, you might ask? It's when two different animals end up having the same trait, even though they don't share a recent common ancestor. Another similar example of convergent evolution is that of dolphins and bats. They both use sound to figure out where they are, but their environment couldn't be more different. Octopuses have been considered fascinating by scientists and non-scientists alike. From their remarkable memories to their ability to camouflage themselves, these creatures are nothing short of incredible. They've been known to use objects to solve problems, and they even dream. Yeah, you heard that right. The color ripples that we can see across their skin as they sleep can show us that they may be dreaming too. However, octopuses are notoriously difficult to study. They can touch every part of their body with those long arms, which means they may have no problem removing whatever tracking objects scientists might have placed on them. Imagine humankind effectively colonizing the Red Planet, and you're one of the first people to brave this challenging journey. During the long, long flight, you entertain yourself with the thoughts of landing on Mars, getting a nice piece of land, building a house. Wait, wait, wait. The problem is you can't own anything in space. Broadly speaking, no one can own space. But this issue becomes more complex than that once you start looking into the particulars. Space is governed by a special agreement called the Outer Space Treaty. According to this treaty, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, can't be subject to national appropriation, even by means of use or occupation. In other words, no nation can declare itself the owner of any part of space. So, that piece of land on Mars can't be yours. Space is declared to be the province of all humankind. But the contents in space are a different matter. For example, you might have a right to occupy a certain orbit. It means that you can place and keep your satellite in that orbital slot. Plus, when a nation registers its space object, it gets the right to exercise exclusive control over it. So, if one country built a moon base on the surface of Earth's natural satellite, this base would belong to this nation. 
but no one would be able to claim ownership over the land this moon station would stand on. But then, how about asteroid mining? Asteroids are rich in minerals, in particular, such metals as iron, nickel, gold, platinum, magnesium, palladium, and many others. According to NASA estimates, the value of asteroids that we could potentially exploit for resources could be worth as much as 700 quintillion dollars. And a quintillion is a number with 18 zeros. Who would be the owner of all that wealth? Well, the Moon Agreement obliges the participants to establish special procedures to control the exploitation of the natural resources of the Moon and other space bodies. But so far, it's still a bit unclear what rules this process will follow. In total, there are five international treaties related to space law. They're all overseen by the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, on Kapuos. You've already heard of the Outer Space Treaty. It's the foundation of international space law, and here are its principles for space exploration and operation. First of all, space activities should benefit all nations. Any country can actually explore orbit and beyond. There can be no claim for sovereignty in space. No dangerous weapons are allowed in orbit and beyond. The moon, the other planets of our solar system, and other celestial bodies can be used solely for peaceful purposes. Any astronaut from any country is considered an envoy of humanity, and all other nations that are the participants in the treaty have to provide them with all possible help when needed. It includes an emergency landing in a foreign country or at sea. Also, each of the countries that signed the agreement is in charge of its space activities and must provide constant supervision. And finally, nations are responsible for damage caused by their satellites and other space objects and must prevent space contamination. Now, even though nations can't lay claim to space and its resources, are there any constrictions determining who can keep stuff from space that landed on our planet? For example, in July 2022, space debris from SpaceX fell in a farmer's backyard in the snowy mountains. If this is the case, space junk must be returned to the country where it came from. But what if it was a meteorite carrying potentially valuable minerals? Specialists say that if this space traveler lands in your own backyard, as opposed to the property you rent, then you become the owner of this meteorite. But if you find the same meteorite on public land, you won't be able to keep it because meteorites are classified as protected objects under the Protection of Movable Cultural Heritage Act, 1986. When watching a beautiful sunset over the sea and in the mountains, have you ever thought about what a sunset on Mars looks like? Or on Venus? Do they have the same reddish hues as sunsets on Earth? Not really. You see, Sunsets look very different on different planets because of the composition of their atmospheres. Sunlight scatters off of the molecules that make up an atmosphere. This process is more effective at shorter wavelengths, which is the blue end of the visible spectrum. That's why we perceive the sky on our home planet as blue. But at sunset, light needs to travel longer distances through the atmosphere. That's why we see yellow and red hues. Now. Let's move to Mercury and check what sunsets look like there. Both sunrises and sunsets on Mercury are views to behold. The sun seems two and a half times larger in the sky over this planet than when you look at it from the surface of Earth. It also rises and sets twice during a Mercurian day. It rises, arcs across the sky, stops, moves back to the rising horizon, stops again, and restarts its way toward the setting horizon. Such bizarre maneuvers occur because Mercury rotates three times for every two orbits around the Sun, and its orbit is extremely elliptical. But if you expect to see a blazing sky and the hues of red, you'll be disappointed. Mercury has almost no atmosphere, so its sky is always black since light doesn't get scattered at all. Let's continue our journey and go to Venus. There, at sunset, a bright yellow fades into orange, brown, and then when the sun disappears, black. The planet rotates on its axis very slowly. So to see a sunset, you'd have to wait almost 116 times, as long as you would on our home planet, half of a Venusian year. 
Mars is widely known as the Red Planet because of its rusty color caused by the presence of iron oxide in its soil. But sunsets on this planet would look surprisingly blue if you watched them from the surface of Mars. Fine dust in the atmosphere of the planet scatters light and makes the blue hues around the sun's area of the sky brighter. A Uranian sunset is azure, fading into royal blue with some hints of turquoise. The pretty colors come from the interaction of sunlight with the planet's atmosphere, which mainly consists of hydrogen, helium, and methane. These gases absorb the longer wavelength red portion of the light, and the shorter wavelength blue and green light get scattered when photons bounce off the gas molecules and other particles in the atmosphere. In 2014, scientists working with data received by NASA's Cassini mission showed what a sunset on Titan could look like. The largest moon of Saturn is surrounded by haze and smog. It's the only satellite in the solar system with a measurable atmosphere, which mostly consists of nitrogen, around 95%, and methane, about 5%. High in the atmosphere of this moon, the nitrogen and methane get split apart by the ultraviolet light from the sun and high energy particles accelerated by Saturn's magnetic field. The compounds produced during this process create a thick, orange-colored smog. As the sun sinks toward the horizon, these orange hues turn into a deep brown. Now look at this. It looks like a sunset on Earth, right? But it might actually be what it looks like on Saturn. We have to say might because, just like all images from space, we can rarely get the color right. They are neither true nor false. They just represent the physical processes underlying the subjects of the images. As for the photo of a sunset on Saturn, it's hard to say if it looks exactly like this before we get more scientific data.